The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After Jesus had said this, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Gracious God, I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your Spirit, and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're full this morning. What a wonderful thing. Can you hear me? If you, can't, if you can't hear me, let me know. Just raise your hand and we'll tell the sound team. So, of course, this morning is Palm Sunday, and we begin with the triumphal entry. We, we're adjusting the liturgy a little bit this morning. We'll end the service this morning with the reading of the Passion Gospel, and then we'll exit in silence. So... This morning is among the most difficult mornings to preach. The whole moment is an anomaly in our story. Truth is, at the original triumphal entry, everything about that was, was wrong. Now, I should back up a minute. Not everything, because Jesus did do it. He did cooperate with it and, and, uh, and fully sort of went along with it. But... Jesus had a completely different idea of what was happening, as far as we can tell, different from everybody else. Nobody else really knew what was about to happen. And I, 
I think the reason for that remains true today. Hopefully, hopefully those of us who follow Jesus can understand this a little differently, but at the deepest level, we're all kind of impaled on this problem. And fundamentally, the problem is that we reject the notion of suffering. Now, just a minute. I know we all suffer. And I know we've all probably, at least at some level, learned from our sufferings. But let's just be open to that for a moment, for, for a while. I, I invite you to be open to that thought, that, that human beings abhor suffering were what I like to call pain-avoiding creatures, right? You know? You want to know why you don't change? Because it's not painful enough to stay where you are. <laughs> That's why when it's too painful, then we'll change. So immediately before this, for the final time, Jesus had told his followers that he was to suffer, that he was to be handed over to humanity, that they would scourge him, mock him, convict him and finally kill him and that he would rise on the third day. At least three times in Luke's story, Jesus says that explicitly, and that was the last time. Several other times, he infers it quite clearly. And after he said that, the disciples, Luke tells us, did not understand that saying. And Luke goes on to say, indeed it was hidden from them. Jesus had plainly told them repeatedly. Now we're in the 19th chapter of Luke's story this morning. Chapter 9 was the first time. For 10 chapters, Jesus has been on his way to Jerusalem to, to be killed. And his followers just refuse to hear that truth. Immediately following this triumphal entry, Luke tells us Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and wept. He wept because they had missed the time of their visitation. And he told them, because you have missed your moment, you are going to be destroyed. In fact, not one stone will be left upon another. It will be that bad because you have refused your visitation. From that saying, immediately he goes into the temple and disrupts the activity of the temple as an enacted parable that that's what was coming. Now, what I want us to hear and just sort of pause in the presence of is that the, the people just just could not hear that the Messiah was to suffer. Now we know this. We look back on it and we see it differently. It's in our Eucharistic prayer. It's in the reading we had from Philippians, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, pouring himself out even to death on the cross. In our Eucharistic prayer, Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us. He stretched out his arms on the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will. Now for me, I said it's one of the most difficult topics to preach to because there's a great mystery here. There's a great mystery in suffering. Just that there's anything at all, that there's existence itself is mystery, but that existence carries on with suffering is inexplicable. And the scriptures really nowhere explain it. Now for me, the whole notion of the evolution of all things is helpful to me to understand it. But the reality is, God has created a world 
with tragic, horrible suffering. And then here's the deal. We don't like it. Thank you very much. And so we have this way of avoiding it. Or, or when it comes upon us, we have a way of doing everything we can to push it aside. And you've heard me say before, if you've been here long enough, and you might, you might remember, that one of the things I, I invite us to do is not to over-sentimentalize the suffering of Jesus. It's kind of like poor Jesus did all this as some sort of a transaction between Jesus and God on my behalf. The reality is, he invites us to follow his example and to live in the midst of a suffering world, knowing both life and death, both suffering and joy and to live deeply into both things, not necessarily resolving any of it. So this year, our Lenten program, we invited artists in our parish, just St. Barnabas artists, to make artistic renderings of the Stations of the Cross. Some, some traditions have 14 Stations of the Cross, some traditions have 12, we invented a new tradition and decided to do 10 Stations of the Cross. <laughs> Erica says I'm wrong, which is not uncommon. So. <laughs> so I think we did 10 stations. 10 Bible-based stations. Thank you very much. All right. And Every evening, we, we did it for in Wednesday, Wednesday nights, and I, I was able to attend them all. And at every one, I sat on the verge of tears. Some of them, the tears flowed. Even when they didn't flow, I was on the verge of tears. And I would go home Wednesdays after this program and tell my wife how profoundly meaningful it was to me. I was all emotional. I'd start to write something on social media, and she'd say, you can't do that. That's too emotional. <laughs> you just can't get that emotive. So I would, I would dial it back. And, and as the weeks progressed, I was asking myself, why is this so meaningful to me? Why is it touching me so deeply? And I think it really wasn't until the last week that I realized it's because each of the artists, in, and now in different ways, each of them as they sat before the station of the cross they were going to work with, it opened them to their own suffering. It opened them deeply to their selves, and their art demonstrated that, and their story about it demonstrated that. And I knew, I knew that what they did was they invited me into holy ground to be with them in the presence of that suffering, and to be with Jesus' suffering and our suffering, holding that together, even as a people of resurrection life. In our burial office, it says that in life we are in the midst of death. Interestingly, in the, in the marriage ceremony in our Episcopal prayer book, in the blessing over the couple, we, we pray this blessing. We say, we thank you, Lord, that you have made the way of the cross to be the way of life. Now, I've married few people that were open to that thought. <laughs> but after you've been married a while, you might be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a people... To be able to hold faith and hope in the midst of love that is present to our suffering and the suffering world. To hold it all is what I think God asks of us. I think it's exactly what Jesus did. 
So our artist for me invited us to that, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. So I think it was the first evening that Tony Conyers brought us this cross. Am I right about that? Was that the first evening or the second? The third. See, I need a lot of help. So this cross, actually I'm going to take my cross off and put on Tony's. Maybe I am. I got it all tangled up now. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me start over. <laughs> Where am I? I'm hooked here. Okay. All right. Just one minute. All right. Is my hair okay? <laughs> Straighten up my stole and all of this. So, all right. So I want to start. So I wanted to wear Tony's cross. You can't see it, I know, but each of these is a station of the cross, and then in the cross itself is a miniature of all those stations. And what was powerful, as Tony shared this with us, was the painstaking work of doing this. Hours and hours and hours, all out of his love and devotion. And I, I'm not going to recount the process to you. Tony's right over here. If you... This, is, this will be on display for a while, and if you look at it, if you want to know, you can, you can talk to Tony, or it should be on our website, the interview with Tony. Yeah, okay. But as I listened to Tony, I mean, he wasn't telling us about his suffering, but he was telling us about his discipline and his love and his devotion, and it meant all the world to me. Joanne Berg, this is Joanne's, and by the way, for the folks in the 1021, we're going to try to put these, I think when we post this sermon, we'll, we'll put the, put the art, art renderings I'm able to talk about on it. I can't talk about them all. Joanne Berg, this is her, her painting here. And, and um, I did cry when Joanne talked about it. She said, let me be sure I get this right. Joanne said, my consistent impression while considering, my consistent impressions while considering creating this piece were feelings of abandonment, despair, and overwhelming exhaustion. And notice in her rendering, the streets are empty. And as it moves along, it, it means to embody this sense of claustrophobia. So there's Jesus carrying his cross, and, and Golgotha is in the distance, and it's inevitable, and there's nothing but Jesus himself on his way. Now, as Joanne told the story, she talked about her own depression. She talked about her own feelings of abandonment and lost, lo being lost, and when she was in despair. And it was just a wonderful moment that Jesus understood what it was to feel like she felt. And as she shared that, I remembered my despair. And somehow, it honored my suffering. Roland Patak depicted Jesus falling. And Roland, all that's in, in Roland's rendering is just Jesus carrying the cross and he stumbled. And everything around it is, 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 is faded out. Roland did that to try to depict Jesus in a cosmic moment. And he used Richard Rohr, it's a title of Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward. And Jesus looks exhausted. And he looks all alone. And he's stuck between two decisions. So... Roland also referenced Thomas Keating's what he calls the double bind. And we're going to read that in the, in the Passion Gospel. We'll read Jesus in Gethsemane. And he's making this agonizing decision. Father, must it really be this way? Must I really drink of this chalice? Could it not pass from me? Can I not stay here and do all the good that's going on? Wouldn't that, would that not accomplish the salvation of the world? And I, as, I, as I sat there, listened to Roland talk about that, I realized how often I am stuck 
between two good choices. But I can only choose one. And the agony of that, and I know we all experience that. Which choice do I make? Roland talked about Jesus' exhaustion. And Betsy, <laughs> I think this is the, the, the evening Betsy reference. She said it reminded her of how exhausted she felt when she was giving birth to our first child. And she said, she said, Jimmy, it wasn't that I was tired. It was that, can I bear this pain for one more moment and one more moment and one more moment? And she felt heard. She felt honored. She felt that Jesus saw her. Roland saw her in her suffering. Liza Bell, her Rot Liza Bell's picture is in the music center. Folks in the 1021, it should be there. Liza depicted the scene where Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. And, and in that scene, Jesus tells them, don't weep for me. It's a continuation of his weeping over Jerusalem. He says, weep for yourselves and for your children. The women know generations of suffering are to come. And Liza, in the most magnificent way, talked about how those women are every woman and how women bear the suffering of the world because they have to. And again, I just, I knew that to be true. So again, I, I can't talk about all the artists. We had some beautiful works from musicians that were just stunning. I remember especially Jennifer Stege. She played the Native American flute, and she said she called it Mary's song. And she wanted the flute to literally mimic the sound of Mary in her mourning. And she did that beautifully. So... This morning we're on the precipice of Holy Week. We move from this wonderful triumphal celebration. And for, by the way, we do it differently now than that first triumphal entry. I understand that. But we start here and then we're on the brink of looking into this, this suffering of the Messiah which is also the model for the suffering of humanity which is also the invitation for us to be willing to live with our suffering even as we also live in eternal life, resurrection life, right here, right now. Of all the things I look back on in my 12 years at St. Barnabas, if I wanted to be, if I can say it this way, things I'm proud of, one of the ones that I'm most pleased with is our mental health initiative that we, we have folks meeting to talk about mental illness and the, and the challenge of it and our various ways that we experience it. And, and one of the reasons I'm so pleased is because it's an area where we're peeling back the curtain of privacy and we're peeling back the, the notion that we can't talk about these things. But, and we're becoming the place where we can suffer together. We can suffer deeply and tragically and be in the midst of life, resurrection life. I can't reconcile those themes. I don't even want to. I just want to identify them for us this morning. Invite us all to follow this example of our Savior. It's not some transaction out there on our behalf. It's a way of life we're invited into. Amen.